I know, what do you think? Hang on. Man, you got a cape. I didn't get a cape. Why, why didn't I get a cape? Join the team. Hey team, this is the McGuire Review, and we're going to take a look at a brand new game from Blacklist Games called Hour of Need that you can currently get on Kickstarter, and let me tell you, it's a pretty fun title. Alright, before we get started with anything, we are going to do another awesome giveaway. We're going to do a giveaway on Hour of Need. This will be for a Kickstarter version of this game. Team, you know how it works. Click that subscribe button and comment below. Follow me on Twitter as well, like the Facebook page if you want to. Following on Twitter is not required. Liking Facebook is not required. You do have to be a team member, though. Be subscribed here on YouTube and comment below. And before the Kickstarter is over, Bear will hit the button of fate. Super Bear will hit the button of fate here. And one lucky team member will be selected, and you will get a free copy Kickstarter version of this game, which is pretty awesome. Okay, follow me on Twitter if you can. That really helps with the communication of everything. Keeps it nice, simple, and clean. You get those quick notifications of when any announcements are made. We do some cool stuff on Twitter as well. Okay, so, Hour of Need. What are we getting with Hour of Need? Again, this is from Blacklist Games, the Saddler Brothers that may ring a bell. They did Alter Quest, which was a recent Kickstarter. Highly successful, very awesome game. This is another title directly from these guys, and it is also very fun. So I'm going to hit a few things I really like about this game to kind of start off. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what this game has to offer, and we'll look at sort of how gameplay plays out. I'm not going to do a full playthrough. There are some videos out there for that if you already want to check those videos out. Uh, but I'm going to give you sort of my opinion of this game and reasons that I do think this title is very fun, and it's a really cool game. I think solo gamers are really going to enjoy this game. It is a one to four player game, but if you're a solo gamer, I think you're really going to like this game. It offers a lot of thoughtful mechanics as you play out the game um, from a solo perspective. Um, I would say I probably prefer this game as a solo style game just because of how the design is executed in the way that the actions work and the way the different phases of the game work. So... If you're a solo gamer, I think you're really going to love this title, and you should definitely give it a look. Again, it's on Kickstarter right now, so you can go to Kickstarter right now and actually check it out. The link will be in the description below. Okay, Hour of Need. Now, there's quite a few different things on the table here, but one thing that jumped out to me immediately... Bear, if you can give me the box, please. Okay. Yeah, it's... I'm not the box flip guy, all right? Okay, you can see there's some really cool artwork on the box that I have. Again, this is a demo kit, okay? I wouldn't necessarily consider this a prototype kit. I, I do feel like most of what's here, uh, I'm sure there'll be things that will be, you know, tweaked as it goes to production, but this is a very, very high quality, what I would consider a production version of this game, just a much more scaled back edition of it. It is the demo kit. It only includes one issue. We'll talk about what that means here in a second, but you can see the box there. First thing that jumps out to me is it's a good form factor. If this is the size that we see in production, this is a great form factor for travel. A lot of those solo gamers like to travel with their games. This will fit nicely, easily into a suitcase. Once you get the box, it's a little bit wider. Sometimes it doesn't fit in those, those single carry-ons for those short trips. Okay, So great form factor, and it's a good small form factor for the game as well. Bear hold that. Okay, <clears throat> now... One thing that I like with the form factor of the game is that if you're sitting at, you know, a smaller uh, table, you're traveling, whatever, you're doing some solo gaming anywhere, it, it takes up a pretty small footprint. Now, I have things kind of spread out over this table, uh, but even this table is pretty small. You can have a much tighter footprint if you pull everything in. And again, if you're just playing by yourself, you're playing solo, you can play multiple characters. I've got a two-player uh, setup here going. 
or you can just play one character, which works very well and scales very well with the game as well. So I have Majesty here and Micro Guy. They both, I thought, were very cool characters. All four of the heroes in the game here are the other two here. Bear, if you want to hit those with the miniature cam, just so everybody can take a look at some of these miniatures, uh, as well as the ones that we have sitting up here. I did really like the design of the miniatures and the fun they kind of bring to this title. Obviously, it is a superhero type game superhero theme these are not your you know standard they're not the supermans the batmans the marvel characters these are their own sort of versions of superheroes they do take some likeness from various different superheroes in the different universes however they are their own sort of characters in this title as well as the villains now for this issue you're only going to get one villain for this demo kit so let's talk a little bit about what we mean with these issues. And I think this is where this game offers a lot of fun replayability. You can play this game time and time again with the same issue because every time your sort of heist type things are going to change, your uh, different schemes that are attached to your heroes, every hero will start the game with a with a single like scheme that's going on that they're sort of addressing um, in conjunction with your villain and how they're kind of running around the map that's going to change it's kind of a random thing with every game that you start off and you can play different heroes and every single one of the heroes are completely different it isn't a generic hero deck with generic actions there are some generic actions that cards can take and we'll talk about that but every one of these heroes is completely unique in in every way their abilities their skills and it's really cool the board also represents an issue. And you'll see that this is printed. These sort of cards are printed on these boards. And these are various different, you know, schemes and things that are going to play out over the course of this issue. And the villain will move from one to two to three to four. And if they get all the way through, they're able to escape. There's some other things that will end the game and will allow the villain to escape. But that's how these points are going to work. And they do correspond. They've got some corresponding spots here on the map where if you wanted to get there, you'd have to make it to that spot and then all of a sudden you would you know you would be in that area so if you wanted to get to the century bank you'd have to make it to this spot right here and now all of a sudden you'd be inside the century bank trying to solve something that might be going on there the villain hidden behind the scenes is orchestrating they will be these little minions that will come out and get put on various different areas there'll be these lackeys that will come out and they do have a color-coded base of where they will start on the board and you'll have to combat and deal with them those are sort of like top sort of henchmen that will uh, come out over the course of the game when you draw um, your various different villain cards here we'll talk about what a round looks like here in a second essentially this game will come with um, more than one issue so this is one issue and it's kind of one of those titles that could be looked at as ever expanding you can continue to have more heroes you can have more villains you can have more issues that that's what makes this title really cool is that you've got a lot of replayability here and you can continue to add every time you come out with a new issue you're essentially getting a new game essentially using the same rules but you're getting a new game with that new issue because that new issue is going to have a whole new different puzzle to solve okay that leads me to a really important statement this game, in my opinion, is very much a puzzler. It's a puzzler with a very fun, colorful superhero theme put on top of that. Because over the course of this game, you are going to be essentially... It's not, it's not all about just meeting up and doing combat. It's about strategically positioning your heroes where they need to be at the right time. Now... When you get to those spots, you're going to be solving schemes. You're going to be combating minions and lackeys and even the villain at some point to defeat them. Yes, all those things are going to play out and all those things are going to happen. But it's really about strategically moving around this map and working together to land in the right spot at the right time to be able to solve this puzzle that you're getting dealt and that puzzle is made up of multiple pieces. That's another thing that I really like. It isn't all about just track down the villain and take out the villain. It's watch the villain's movement, take out the villain, make sure the hostages are saved, make sure you're dealing with your, your specific heist that you have going on. The, the bank, the vault is the heist with this issue. And what's going on in your issue deck. It's dealing with the you know various villain cards that come out here 
and what they present to the board. It's all of that. And that's why I like this game, is there's a lot of different components that are going on in that city, and it is very thematic if you think about how these superhero comics kind of play out. You really do feel like you're in a comic. This is issue number one in the comic, and you're going through, trying to make sure that obviously your heroes are the victors at the end of that comic book. I like that. I really do like that from a theme perspective. The artwork is awesome. I can't say enough about the artwork. It's, it's really fantastic. I love the characters. I've already stated that, but I, but I want to say it again. I really do like the superhero characters that are here. Um, these are two of my favorites. I love Micro Guy. He's sort of this little, this smaller sort of micro type character that pilots this giant mech that moves around the board, which I, I think the mech is really cool. This is sort of a female version of kind of like a Superman. She's got various uh, Superman type abilities with, you know, the, the laser eyes and different things from that perspective. She can fly. She's super fast. I mean, it's really strong. I just I really like her look and and uh, sort of how they how, where they went there. I love the cape. How cool is that? Sort of the rainbow colored sort of cape. Just very very cool characters that they created for this title. Now the other two characters that we have here, one of them is kind of like a Flash type character called Stride. And again, they have their own double sided cards. We'll take a look at the double sided character cards in their own deck. It's a good sized deck. Uh, and then another character that's I don't really know how to describe this character. Um, maybe, maybe sort of comparable to kind of a cable type type character. Potentially is kind of what it what he is. He's got he's, he's kind of a more muscular. He carries knives. He's got sort of some firearms. Um, he's a really cool. He's a really cool character as well. Okay, so here's our other characters. There are some few cards that are left out of the game when you do set up the game, depending on how many players there are in the game. So that's what you'll see here with this deck. And then everything else on the table is just going to be various tokens that you're going to acquire. There's some things you might have to interact with. There's these hidden tokens that get placed on your villain. Once both of these are gone, you, you accomplish taking these off over the course of the game. Then your villain is no longer hidden and will have to kind of come to the board and you can interact with that villain. You do have some uh, scheming tokens that are here, as well as some justice tokens. These are just tokens that you'll acquire over the course of play that will help you get more successes. You can cash them in. You can get them when you roll dice. We'll talk about these dice here in a second. And they're just sort of those extra bonus type tokens. And you'll need these to solve the different um, schemes around the board. So if you wanted to solve this one, you would need this, this number here has a little 10 on it you would need to come up with with 10 uh, justice tokens and solve be able to solve this card and then you'd flip it over and you'd, you would interact with something this one here is a uh, it's called the locksmith and it's a scheme and it will activate upon the player's turn and here's something you'll have to do and once you solve it it will remove one of those hidden tokens and then you'll have to deal with whatever's on the back and that's usually going to be some type of sort of mini boss that you'll have to deal with and there'll, there'll be something that it will do and it will it will list right out on the text exactly what happens so that's very easy with this game is you know all the text that's necessary for you to know like well what does this do what does a symbol mean it's right on your quick start card and it's right on the actual cards all you really have to know is the phases of the game there's a couple little tweaky rules around like when to draw a card and whatnot but other than that it's a very simple straightforward game that all of the information is really on the board and on the cards for you at all times all right then we've got our bystander tokens you'll notice that there's four bystanders that start on the board these are really beneficial bystanders are important especially the ones that are here on the map now, once those four spots fill up and if more bystanders have to be added to the map, they will go into these areas with the villain. They'll be captured, and then you can spend successes when you try to solve different schemes to you know, rescue those captured bystanders. But to get a bystander, all you really have to do is just move into a space that's there where that, where that bystander is, and then you can rescue the bystander, take it off the board. Now, the benefit there is it does give you a clue card. You also will get these clue cards whenever you fully solve. Any card that needs to be solved, you get a clue card. And these are great because they offer sort of a bonus 
action on your turn or a bonus thing that you can do. And they'll always have some dice that are up top. That just means you can add more kind of dice to your roll if you want to cash it in and use it for that. Or they will have some text on the bottom that will offer something. So this one's called Point of Interest. It offers two extra dice if you want to do it that way. Or you may either place one justice token on each problem card or place three justice tokens on one problem card. And that's good because as you're trying to solve those problem cards, these cards with these little sort of purple clouds on them with a number, they are the same. As you're trying to solve those cards, you then can put justice tokens on those to say, well, I've already got, I've already got, uh, if I wanted to do three on one card, well, I've only got, I've already got three of the 10 here. So now I only need seven. And then on your turn, you could try to solve that card and get that extra seven and then be able to solve it and be done with it. So these clue cards are very beneficial and I would highly recommend going for as much of these as possible and really stacking up on these. Those are what's really going to give you the edge um, during the game. I found these clue cards make a significant difference when you get into the really tight spots and it gets sort of near end game and you're really trying to you know, defeat certain things or solve certain things before time runs out. And a lot of the clock and mechanic of the game is going to come from this area right down here, which is sort of the heist that goes with this issue. It says right here, this is the century heist. It will tell you what it's about. It will give you some setup rules. There might be some different setup rules specific for that issue. And then it will give you some special issues that will go on over the course of this one. So for instance, this one, after a hero attacks the villain, they may discard one justice per person. So it'd be, it'd be two. If it has a little person after the number, it means one that, that many per person. So since we have two people playing, it would be two justice from the vault to return one issue token from the villain card to the vault. If there are three issue tokens on this card, the villain has escaped with the gold and the heroes lose. So you want to make sure that issue tokens are not getting put on this. If you got three, the villain immediately escapes. So there are some triggers to end game that will just allow the villain to escape. If you're not properly managing those issues, they're going on over the course of the game with how many things you're solving. So that that is something that you have to do with some board management here. You really have to manage all those issues over the course of the game. And then we've got the vault here. It's sealed. It starts on this side. It says, if this card ever has three, to three issue tokens on it, discard all tokens from it and flip it over. And then it says, crisis, place one issue token on this card. So if there's ever a crisis that plays out over the course of the game, that will happen from cards. It'll happen, you know, if there are too many um, of the minions in, in areas, you'll hit these things called crisis, and then you will immediately have to take an issue token and, and put it on this card. If there's ever three that are on this card, then you would, you would flip this over, and now something else would play out. And it says here that the Century Vault is now opened. So now it's even closer. The villain has been able to open the vault. It's even more of a problem that you have to deal with. And, the, and the, he's trying to get away with the gold, right? Or in this case, she is trying to get away with the gold, as our villain is a female here. So that's how that's going to work. And then you're going to have a heist deck here that is going to you know, flip over on every turn and add something else to the mix. So now let's look at what a game turn would look like. And our little handy-dandy reference sheet, which I feel like they designed really well, gives us everything that we need to be able to go through. So game round. First thing is the villain turn. Each hero draws and resolves one villain card and resolves each icon on it from left to right. So each hero is going to do that. Start with Majesty here and we'll flip over a first uh, villain card. And okay, well, we got a lackey. The lackey are going to be these figures that have the colored bases and they're going to be placed. Let's see, I would have started down here. They're going to be placed wherever that color indicates. So that right there is where the lackey is going to be put on the boards. The lackey is essentially now at the sentry bank. And it says to us, it's very easy. The top number is their health. The next number is going to be their defense. And then the bottom number is going to be how many dice they would roll, their fight value. So that, that would be how many dice they will roll to try to do damage against a hero that they're interacting with. Okay, now this one does have a little skull on it which means it would go immediately into the player's threat area. Only the cards that have the little skulls go into the threat area, and then the character has to deal with that upon their threat phase 
in their turn. Otherwise, it would just it would do something. It would activate. It have some symbols here. Hopefully, the next card we draw will have some of those. And then you would do you'd play out on the board. It would change the board in some way. And it does say there when it activates, it moves three and inflicts. Okay, so that's not going to happen just yet. It's going to go into the threat area, and that's what's going to be waiting for me when I get to that threat. Okay. So now the second player is going to draw another one. Okay, this one's called Call the Boys. So there are two symbols here that are on this card, this green circle and this other little symbol. So we can go right to our reference sheet and we can see, okay, well, if it's one of these green symbols, which is one of the, it's this symbol right here on the board, you place one minion in the corresponding scheme panel. So we're going to go here and grab a minion, and in the green one, we're going to throw a minion now down in this part of this scheme. So the villain's going to have some extra help. There's already a minion, and it's there messing around. So we might want to deal with that menu by, minion by getting to this area and then taking out that minion. If there's too many, I don't know. We'll have to kind of manage that. There's only one there right now, so it's not that big of a deal. And then we got an extra little special symbol here, which is resolve the corresponding special effect. There is a special effect with this one. There's no skulls, so I don't have to put it in my threat area. I just basically do what it says, and then I move on. So it says special. If no stooge is in play, uh, there's a stooge in play that came out earlier, so that's not good. It says if no stooge is in play, search the villain deck and discard, and discard pile for one stooge, Draw it, shuffle the villain discard pile back into the deck, otherwise each stooge activates. Ugh, not good. All right, so this stooge that is in play, uh, which it is, is right here, will now activate. This stooge moves three and inflicts, so I will go one, two, I will move right there, and then it will inflict. So he is going to roll two dice. Now, technically, I wouldn't be in mech form just yet. I would be in pilot size. So I'm kind of a micro guy right now, all right? And all these cards, all these cards for your heroes will have like a standard size, and then they will have a focused side. You can always cash in five of these focus tokens at any point in time. You're going to have a max of five. And that will allow you to focus your hero and make them like super powered. That's how the micro guy becomes the pilot of the giant mech. But right now we're on this side. So I do have a, an ability here called out of sight, which is an instant. And I can use that right now to not take damage. And it says if your hero card is on his pilot side, which it is, um... Ignore nearby enemies, otherwise you may flip your hero card to choose a hero to draw two cards. So I could either ignore the enemy or I could go ahead and just let them go at me. I'm going to go ahead and let him, let him go at me and hope that I don't really take a lot of damage. So roll and, oh, not good. So they got one, two, they got a burst. Oh my god, three, they got another burst. Four, they got another burst. Five, oh my god, dude. Okay, so that would be five damage to Micro Guy. That's not good because he only has a, a life of ten. So, yeah, that that was silly. I sh I should have used this card here to ignore the enemy, but I did not. So I will go ahead and take five damage, and um, yeah, that's not good. Okay, that got ugly really fast. All right, so that's the end of the villain turn. Thank God. And now we're gonna go to the actual hero turns. Where each hero readies each exhausted card in their hero play area, performs two actions, and then resolves their threat phase. Well, I don't have any exhausted cards. I'm just starting off. Each hero does have two actions, and you'll use these tokens to indicate if you've taken that action or not. Not every card requires you to use an action, but if the card does have the little action symbol on it at the very bottom corner, it will require you to take one of these physical actions. There's also a number of actions that are just required to use your action as well. But there are some cards you can just do that don't actually take one of those action tokens. Okay, so some of the actions that do require you to flip your tokens is you can draw one card. So at any point in time, you can just you can just draw a card from your deck. Now you're gonna get to draw a card at the end of everybody's turn to, to go into your hand, and there is no hand limit, but it will allow you to draw an extra card. So you can draw a, you know, a card from your deck if you wanna get some extra options, maybe you don't like what you got, and when you start the game, you will start with four cards, and you are able to take a mulligan for however many cards you'd like. So you can kind of take at least one mulligan to try to get a, a nice hand to start the game. Okay, You can draw one card. You can move up to three spaces. You can play one action card. 
play an action card, okay? One that does require an action. You can attack, which means you'll you'll go in and roll some dice, and you'll roll a number of dice depending on what your hero will allow you to do. So much like we saw with our villain, top number is going to be our health. Next number is going to be how many dice we roll when we attack. The number bottom is going to be how many dice we roll if we're solving something. So anytime you see that little purple cloud, that corresponds with the purple clouds everywhere else. That's the number of dice you roll to solve purple clouds. Now cards may give you the ability to roll more dice if you're attacking or roll more dice when you're solving. And the characters are different, right? So uh, I can only roll two dice with this character when I'm solving. Micro guy rolls three dice when he's solving. So you might want to use micro guy to do a lot more of the solving and majesty here to do a lot more of the fighting across the board. Okay? So... After we do our actions, it says, after the last hero completes their threat phase, each hero draws one card. So again, we draw one card after everybody has completed threat phase. And then we take the issue phase, okay? So I would take two actions on my turn, and then I would do the threat phase. The threat phase is what's right up here on top of each of these characters. Now, you will take the threat phase when this hero is done with their two actions. And I specify that because... This game has the model where you saw all the villain kind of stuff played out. Then it was the hero's turn. This hero is not going to go through all of their actions. And then this hero go through all of their actions. The players around the board, or the single player controlling multiple characters, will choose how those actions integrate and how they play out. So I may want to take one action... And then I may want to take Micro Guy, have both of his actions, and then I may want to go back and take Majesty's last action. But whenever a, a character has completed both of those actions, you will kind of pause on the actions, and that hero will need to play out their threat. Whatever is up in this top area, which you know generally will be the one scheme that they're working on, unless there are those cards that come out that have the skulls on them when the heroes are drawing then they will immediately go into their threat area. So let's say that Micro Guy, you know, played out a few different actions over the course of the board and was done with his turn and then needed to do his threat. So he'd go here to his scheme, and it does take seven to solve. And let's say I didn't do any solving towards that scheme. It's the manufactured hysteria scheme. Somehow the villain is broadcasting from the news tower, causing a city-wide panic. Okay, that sucks. All right, activate. If there are four bystanders on the map, a crisis occurs. Okay. Well, one, two, three, four. Let's say nobody was able to, to get to any of those bystanders over the course of the term. There are four bystanders on the map. Crisis hits. So we'll just grab one of these right here. Okay, and it says here on the vault, place one issue token on this card if a crisis happens. So one would get stuck on the card and the vault because there is a crisis. So you're messing with a crisis while the villain continues to work away at that vault and isn't interrupted at all. Okay, and I would have no way of, of even starting to solve this scheme because it is the green one here, which corresponds to the green spot on the board and the green scheme. These cards, you know, this is, this is identical. It's printed right here on the board. I would need to be, so Micro Guy would need to be at that spot to be able to try to start solving this scheme. So that is important because this is going to activate every turn. Like your threat is going to activate. So you do want to solve these schemes as fast as possible because if there are four bystanders on the map, a crisis occurs. So you're either going to have to be managing those bystanders around the map or you're going to have to be solving this scheme because if this scheme activates, the villain can move. If the, if the scheme is, is able to activate. So we, we do have to be very careful that, there's, that we're solving the scheme and that we're taking care of bystanders. And that's how these are going to work together. Once the scheme is solved, you'll flip it over. Get something there at the back that's going to also affect and change the board and what's going on. Okay? So that's how those schemes work out. We'll put Micro Guy there right next to the scheme as if he was going to be solving that. Then once each character has taken their, uh, their threat phase, once they're done with their actions... Then we're going to draw cards. So after last hero completes their threat phase, each hero draws one card. So each hero is going to get to draw a card, kind of add to their hand what we got here. Out of sight, another great one where micro guy can slip out of sight. And then we got the power of positivity. Nice. This is an instant. We gain one dice when we attack 
or we can exhaust the card. So these cards will do different things. You can, you know, get the ability that's on them right there. And it usually gives you a couple different choices. Or we can exhaust this card, which means we just kind of tap it to the side. And this will, when you, when you, when you would suffer damage, reduce that damage by two, or discard this card and reduce that damage to zero. So it would just kind of allow you to, to get out of some damage or attack a little bit more. These cards also come with some generic icons that are on them. You'll see this little blue fist right here. There's four different types of symbols that you're going to find. This fist helps you fight a little bit better. If you just want to cash it in and say, I just want more fight, this is what this will give you. There are ones that will help you solve better. Is this little blue gear right here. There's ones that will help you move better. This little wing that's on this one. Here's another one here that's on this card. Helps you shield better. So every one of these cards can be used for multiple different things, whether you're cashing in on its instant ability, whether you're tapping it and getting ability, and whether you're just using it for its generic ability to either move or defend or fight a little bit better. And not every card has that. So they are all completely different, okay? And that's cool. All right, so we've, we've drawn our card. Now we're going to do the issue phase, which is the last thing that happens, and that's right down here at the bottom. It says the players draw and resolve one issue card. So there's only one issue card that comes out, not one per player like there is with the villain cards at the very beginning. And that's the end of our round. So we'll grab our Century Heist issue here and we'll flip it over and it says Panicked Guard. If the vault, our vault, is on its sealed side, it is, place one issue token on it if able. Otherwise, the villain schemes. So... I can place an issue on it because it says if it has at least three, we flip it. So I can place an issue on there. So I grab this and place an issue, and now the vault has two issues on it. Remember, once it has three, it's opened up and the gold is accessible to the villain. But it has two. Now, if that already had three, uh, or I, you know, I couldn't put any more before it would flip, then what would happen is the villain would scheme. So I would go here and the villain would be able to scheme wherever they are, and then that would that scheming would get activated wherever that villain was. So that's what would happen there, and then something bad would happen on the board depending on what those different schemes were. Now when it comes to the villain, again, we talked about the villain at some point once they get their hidden tokens off, once we've solved our primary schemes, will be able to no longer be hidden and will end up either coming to the map or staying in one of these locations, and then you can start combating the villain. But the villain does become much more powerful. It flips over as well, then has a health. We can see here it's 15 per player, so the health of this villain is 30. So you have to do quite a bit of damage to this villain to take this villain out. It only has one defense, and then three when it's going to combat you. It's got three combat dice. Then there is an activate, inflict, targeting each hero within four spaces of this hero and whoever is able to unhide the hero that that villain will come into the threat track of one of those heroes it won't just sit out it will literally move into the threat track of one of the heroes that does the final reveal of that because it does have the little skull on it so that can be dangerous as well only one of those heroes is really found and that's thematic one of the heroes has really found the villain and is in that combat while the other is helping that primary character after that villain has been found on the map in the comic book issue okay team that's pretty much the whole game those are all the mechanics you're going to run into over the course of play that's what a round is going to look like that's how the board is going to play out you can see there's a lot of different moving things that are happening on the board that you're going to have to manage it's it's a pretty small board but quite a bit of management within that small board i do like the form factor i like that the board is smaller like that the only thing that we have left out are these little peril tokens this is just another type of thing that you have to interact with and those will come out on these cards here so there'll be certain cards that'll be peril cards that you will have these little tokens out, and, and the blue goes with blue, and the yellow with yellow. They'll come out, and it's just a little extra thing that's happening there that you need to then deal with. There are various different other types of icons that are on these cards that you will execute from left to right. And again, those icons are right here on your reference card, and you literally, when you see the icon, you just look at your card. Okay, what does it do? The villain inflicts or schemes. Place a bystander. Resolve a special effect. Place a minion at any one of these colors that and symbols that pop up. It's really that simple. This is a well, well-designed reference card for this game that allows you to easily know 
how to go right through each one of the phases of the game and play. All right, team, that's it. That is the Hour of Need. Go check it out on Kickstarter right now. Don't forget about that giveaway. And hit that like button, subscribe below to join the team. Keep rolling, Chris. This has been the McGuire Review. And we'll see you next time, Bear. Let's roll!